So, welcome everybody, welcome all our Torah Anytime uh, listeners and uh, viewers. So, today we're going to be discussing Be'ezrat Hashem, the second class on Dibukim, exorcism. So, before we actually get started, I have a bit of a long introduction that I need to discuss. So, I usually get responses after my classes, depending on the class. Uh, this particular one, the last week that, I, that we had the class on, the, on Dibukim, this one I got a significant amount of, of responses. And it was, it was some, you know, some of the, on both sides, which I'm used to, I'm fine, you know, give or take, I'm, I'm all up for it, give me the bad, give me the good, I'm all, I'm all in for, for both, uh, um, both sides of the coin. And, but surprisingly, I got a tremendous, tremendous amount of, why are you giving this class? This class should not be taught. Nobody needs to know about these things. You're scaring people. Why are you doing this? Who told you this? One of the best ones. Ask any normal rabbi. He'll tell you you shouldn't give these classes. Um, so I, so, so there, I do want to give an introduction of why I do this. What, what is the point of this? Um, the point is, is not really to scare people. That's not really, if it makes you help you do tshuva, then yes, that is the point. Uh, so if that's the only way you're going to get through fear, then fine. And I told this guy that, uh, that uh, messaged me, one of the guys, you know, it's like, um, just, you know, I said, uh, you know, it helps people do tshuva. Just teach them how to do tshuva. I mean, so, you know, I've been doing this for, for quite a few years, Baruch Hashem, and I want to say it doesn't always help. Just, what's with the fear? Why do people have to fear? Oh my God, I don't understand. It doesn't say it's a lie. You have to fear God? But we're, we're, we, we, where are you learning your Torah from? Like, what, you're supposed to fear God. How are you supposed to fear God? So you read the Torah, you look at it. Granted, this is a little bit more on the Kabbalistic level, uh, but at the same point in time, I don't give over all the information that I have on this. Not that I'm saying that I have a lot. I have a, I scratch the surface of, of whatever this, uh, this is, but whatever I have, I don't give over everything that I think is not appropriate, that doesn't, that's not going to benefit anybody for any mean way or form. So, um, there, but there is a reason why I do it. So before that, though, I started thinking, I'm like, okay, maybe... I shouldn't be giving this class. Like that's like I've never gotten so many responses. Usually I'm like, okay, fine, people like to talk, but now I'm getting so much. I was like, okay, maybe I'm doing something wrong. So let me look. I couldn't find, and maybe I'm wrong, I couldn't find any other rabbi, at least in English. I found one or two in Hebrew that speak about this topic. I'm like, why doesn't anybody speak about this topic? Uh, there's some rabbis that need topics to speak about. I'm like, this is a pretty good topic to speak about. I think it helps people do chuba. One of my last class that I gave this topic on for the men, uh, we had one guy that decided he's going to stop watching TV and movies after this class. So, I mean, that's, you know, that sounds good. So, the, um, so, so then I started thinking, maybe I shouldn't ask, maybe I shouldn't, uh, you know, speak about this topic. So, I went and I asked a few rabbis. I said, should I give this topic or should I not? What do you think they said? Yes. Well, obviously, I'm giving the class now. So, yeah. <laughs> so they said that, that, I, that I, should, I should give it. My source for this, again, I'm not pulling up stuff from a random source stuff that I, you know, I found online. There's a good story about a possession um, that Father Jason decided to do this, and this is a great story, and that's what we're wasting time with. No, I'm bringing stories, and I'm bringing my, again, like I said last time, 90% of the information comes from Minchat Yudab. I've read a few books on, on, on possessions and things like that, but I'm not bringing most of those stuff down. I'm bringing stuff specifically on, in, the, in the Holy Svelim. So now, why is it that I give these type of classes? Because I do. I do, give, I do delve into that more than, than other people. I speak about demons. I speak about reincarnation, dreams, like things that are more uh, you know, possessions. So what is the purpose of that? Um, so there's a few reasons why I do it. Number, um, number one is that I want to try to show people that there is a life after death. There is something that goes on after you die. Now, hypothetically speaking, you're religious from birth. You know everything about the Torah. You're like, of course God exists. Of course that. But it's all very like, yeah, it's there. You know, like, I don't know anything about it, but I just know that it exists. It makes something more real when you hear stories about it. When you hear more details about it, you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is really real. This is not just real. It's, it's, it puts a whole different twist on it. Think of it when you're, when you're studying math and you need to do a certain example. Now, if you just have the word, that, the, the, the explanation on how to do the problem, it's not so easy until you actually see an example of it, and then it actually hits it on and be like, okay, now I know how to do it. So when, you're more, when you have more hands on you, it actually makes it more real. And that is one of the reasons. There is a life after death. Now, what is the main purpose that I'm bringing that for? Why do you need to know so much about that? That there is consequences to if you do something wrong. And if you do something wrong, you have to do tshuva. Otherwise, you could end up, well, hopefully not, but like one of these, uh, one of these cases. So, and, and, you know, speaking about like just telling people do tshuva, 
doesn't really help so much. I've had people that have come to me and they told me they've done one of the worst sins possible. And this happened more than once. And, and they said, what should I do? So I said, you know, you have to do tshuva. And you go through the regular tshuva process. You have to regret it. You have to confess it. You have to make sure you don't do it again. You have to increase your observance, learn, learn a lot more to lot. And I've noticed that it doesn't really help that much. They don't, they don't, really, they don't really do, they're like, okay, fine, I, you know, I, and, but I don't really see much of a change in them. Again, like, yeah, I may be wrong, maybe they're, maybe they're you know, one of the 36 hidden sedikim that came in there and they forget to bring the keep out sometimes, whatever it is, but I'm not, who am I to judge? But I don't feel like it really hits home. So what, and, and by the way, I, you guys would, would know me already, so you know, like, if somebody comes to me and tells me they did a sin, I'm not, I'm not the type of guy to be like, you know, doesn't matter. You know, you're such a good person. You know, God loves you anyways. You know, like, don't feel bad about this. Come on, no. Smile, smile. Every day is a smile. Which you should be smiling every day, but I'm not one of those, like, lovey-dovey, yeah, yes, everything is great. If someone comes and tells me they did a terrible sin, that they committed adultery, I am not going to be there and be like, I'm like, don't worry about it. Don't worry. You gave me such a large donation. Not that I take any money anyways, but I was like, you gave me so much money. <laughs> when you get out there, don't worry about it. I'll save you a spot next to me. He's like, don't worry about it. I got you. Right, this, is, this is Vinny, the guy, you know, was like, he has a connection to the mob boss. He's like, don't worry about it. I'll get you inside. The, any rabbi that tells you, you give him money, and he's going to say, don't worry about it in the next world, he's going to save you a spot next to him. But it's not going to be upstairs. It's going to be somewhere else. So the... Um, the, so the idea behind it is, is that when I started telling people, you know, you did a very bad sin and you think it's bad, you don't even know the half of it. Do you know if you do this and this sin, you're going to, to Gehenom and you're not leaving there. You're going to stay in this. And I start describing them until they get pretty much uncomfortable. And then I tell them all the chuva process. So then I'm like, okay, that's, that, that makes a little difference. Think about it this way. There is a guy who is a smoker. And you go and you tell him, you know, smoking is bad for you. I'd be like, yeah, I read labels on boxes. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And then you take him to a, I don't know, a cancer ward or something. And you, you, you show him how people are smoking through their, you know, through their throats. Or you show them, you know, uh, lungs that are black, that they can't even walk a few steps without coughing hysterically. That's going to make a, lot, a much bigger difference on that person than just telling him. So, and I actually felt that this was a little bit, uh, you know, different. So, there is, you know, I, I did find more success in this method than the other methods as well. You're supposed to tell people, yes, yeah, sometimes it's good to scare people. Granted, you have to have it both. And scare people, you're not on, I, I never, I would never ever make things up to make something more worse than it is. Only why I would say it was exactly how it is. Not more and not less. The, um, you know, the idea behind it is, is, uh, is think of it this scenario. Imagine uh, you're going skydiving. But it's not like skydiving, yay, like an American skydiving where you have a whole crew that comes up and be like, you watch a safety video, right? And then you have another guy like slapped on your back that's, you know, duct tape onto you, you know, like, the, the, you know, and they have like 14 parachutes in case one doesn't open, they have another one, and this one. I'm talking about something that you don't want to go skydiving, but you're on a plane and whatever, it's going down, you got to jump, and there's a guy over there, he throws you on this knapsack. He's like, here, put it on. And on this knapsack, there's like, 400 different ropes that you have to pull. It's an old parachute. I've never been skydiving. I don't know, but bear with me. There's a bunch of strings that you have to pull as you jump out. And then the guy screaming to you says, listen to me and listen to me very, very carefully. You have to do it exactly this way. You have to pull first the red one, and then the blue one, and then the green one. And if you do it any other ma manner, you are going to die a very terrible death. You will flat a fall on your face. You will, you will splatter into different pieces. And, you, and, and he keeps on describing in, in explicit detail what would happen to him. Some of the guys sitting next to him, they're like, Dude, I don't understand. This guy is already nervous. Look at him. He's wet pants already. All right, why you got to make him more nervous? Why you got why you gotta scare him? Just tell him which one he has to do. He says, no, if I don't tell him exactly the way that he's supposed to do and I don't scare him, then he might not remember which one it is. He might think, okay, whatever, I'll just pull all the cords and hopefully something will happen. But if you tell somebody the, the consequences of what happens if you don't pull the right cords, then he's going to be very, very serious and he's going to listen very attentively to make sure that he's, he pulls the right cord. This is the same idea in spirituality. If you come... And if you have somebody that comes over to you and wants to know what to do in, in, uh, you know, in the spiritual realm, you don't have the ability, you don't have the flexibility to go and be like, listen, you know, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do this. You have to tell them exactly the way that it is. Granted, it has to be done the right way.
You can't, somebody comes over to you and be like, hey, listen, uh, you know, I just did a certain sin right now. You're going to get numb. You're never going to leave. You're, you're just a lost case. You might as well as just finish everything. You know, the, obviously, that's not the right way to do with things. You have to do it the right way, but it ha- the truth has to be said, and it, has to be, and, if it, and it scares them. Then it makes them do tshuva. And again, granted, you have people that have mental issues and anxiety issues and depression issues. All that has to be factored in. I'm not saying this is a blanket thing, but this is where I'm coming from. I'm speaking to the general public, and I find this uh, a, a very good way of waking people up. And sometimes in a physical sense, they can't fall asleep at night. Okay, you know, that's not my intent. But at the other, at the other time, at least you are, um, you know, at least you're up, up spiritually, that is. So the... Okay, the last thing that I do want to mention is that the intent that I bring this class, and then we're going to start, the intent that I'm bringing this class is not so that you should think everyone's possessed. You know, like, oh yeah, this person, either bipolar possession for sure. You know, or like, oh yeah, my spouse, yeah, for sure something's going on, you know. (laughs) goes crazy. You know, I, that's, not, that's not my intent. My intent is not to think that everyone's possessed. My intent is actually, the real focus is to see about what happens when you do certain sins, where you end up in. And this granted, so this is a very, very uh, like, like extreme case of what happens, of extreme sinning. But don't think, but, but you know, just minus that for, for different sins. And everybody has to be, you know, gets punished. Everybody has, has, to pay, has accountability that they have to um, pay for it. Okay, so let's begin with, this, with, uh, with tonight's uh, uh, story. It's going to be just one long one. Again, we're going to be speaking about, uh, we're going to be learning through this topic, through, through stories. The details here is extremely, extremely important. This story is also brought down in the Minchat Yehuda. There, this, and again, like the Minchat Yehuda, he brings down not only the, um, the name and the mother's name, he brings down the date also. This is, you know, just makes it show that it's not something just, you know, out of the blue. So the year was 1913. It was a Jewish year, 5673. And a 17-year-old girl by the name of Katun, the daughter of Aziza, came to see him. And this is, what, this is how she describes it. So she's a 17-year-old girl who is possessed. But she goes and she explains her story. She says that uh, she's orphaned from her father. And her mother had to go visit her, um, this 17-year-old girl's brother who lived in Persia. They, this was not in Persia. They, and, and she had to travel to Persia. So this girl, the 17-year-old girl, was, along with her younger brother and her younger sister, had to stay by their aunt while the mother went to Persia to deal with her uh, brother. The problem was is that her aunt was a very, very angry, irritable person. That every little thing that you did, she would blow up and scream and curse and that. Like a, a very, very mean like, uh, like person that, it, you know, like those people that it's just like, you know, you, you, you tiptoe around them and you're like, you feel bad for anybody who lives with them. You know, like one of those, but they were actually living with them. And so this 17-year-old girl would rebuke her, be like, why are you speaking like this? You know, we have little kids around, this is not how you're supposed to speak. And all that did was that angered her even more. And it went up, it went up to, 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 to such a high level that the kids were so scared of her that they had to tiptoe around. They wouldn't, they wouldn't complain, they wouldn't do that. It was literally like they were, they were in prison. And uh, so one day, uh, she was, uh, this, this 17-year-old girl, she was sitting in her bed and she was, she was crying. It was a Saturday night. She was laying down in her bed, face down, and she was crying, 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 you know, because of her ill fortune, where she has to be now and how she has to tiptoe and she feels so bad about her, about her siblings and this and all the, 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 the abuse that she's going through. And suddenly, as she's, as she's laying over there, she feels that there's a huge cat, this like cat-like figure, jumps on her back. And the first thing which she wanted to do was scream, but she knew that if she screamed, then her aunt is going to come in and wh- whatever is going to happen. The problem was is that they don't own a cat. So like, what's this on her back? And you know, sometimes, you know, this is a, a, the worst self-defense possible. You're s- sitting at home and you're about to fall asleep. Let's say you're sleeping, you're living, you know, you're sleeping by yourself. Your house is completely empty. And then you hear something, right? So some people will be like, well, let's check that out. You know, here's my flashlight. Here's my knife. You know, here's my phone. Let's go check it out. Other people will be like, it's going to go to sleep and pretend it didn't happen. You know, like, that's just not. So, you know, that it depends on your, on your method of coping. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's like, 
you know, there's some people that they go, I, know, I speak to a lot of people, they get a lot of interesting, uh, you know, ideas on what people, goes on people's mind. They go into the home and they think someone's there, so they go through all the hiding places, right? They go to the bathroom, they check behind the <laughs> curtains, uh, you know, they'll check under the beds, make sure that no one's there. They do like a scope to check, to make sure that, uh, you know, the serial killer that's hiding inside over there is, is, not, uh, is not over there. And, um, and some people can't do it until, unless they, they go to sleep. And fine, if that's what makes you, you know, works for you, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's always good to, uh, you know, patrol your house and make sure there's no unwanted uh, visitors. But this girl, she has this, this cat on her and she was so scared to do anything, she was so scared to move that she just stayed completely still. And then the cat started scratching on her back as if she tried, it was, the cat was trying to go inside of her. And the, the, you know, it was like so painful until finally, like the pain stopped, but she felt as if the cat went into this, this something went into her arm, her left arm, uh, through her shoulder. And it was, the, the arm became so heavy all of a sudden that she couldn't even move it. It was just like, like limp, you couldn't do it. And she goes on, and this is how she's explaining it to the rabbi. Just from that day on, her arm just trembles, it just moves not by itself, her bones shake by itself, her, uh, her pupils just move erratically, back and forth, like, a, like a, all by itself. It reminded me, of when I was reading, when I was learning about this, I was one time in this group setting and I was sitting next to somebody and I'm very into the, my mentality in it and this is what I teach my children. If there's someone who's doing something funny, we live in New York, you take a subway, everyone's doing it. So every subway ride, there's someone who's, who's doing something you know, funny. It could be talking to themselves, it could be you know, talking to themselves through the mirror, it, it, could be, you know, it could be just like you know, banging their head against the wall. Whatever it is that people are doing, as good New Yorkers, what we are trained to do is ignore it. Right? And unless somebody is, is you know, uh, you know, hurt or injured, then you obviously deal with it. So I'm sitting in this group setting, this person sitting very close to me, and um, I'm doing my thing, they're doing their thing, and all of a sudden, I see this person, you know, out of the corner, I like look up. Now, what happens when you do when someone looks up? You look up also. Yeah, I remember, you know, like doing this. this a, you know, I once went with my, well, my friends, this is talking about when I was a teenager. Went to my friends to, um, uh, to a certain place, and we tried an experiment. It, it really, you shouldn't do this, because you're, you're, you're not, you know, um, wasting people's time. But what we did was, was very simply, just gather all, like, all of us together and just look up. And then just like point, and, you know, and then just look up, and nothing. And then you see like people gathering around, and the interesting part is we stop, and then we listen to what they're pointing at. And I'll be like, yeah, you see it? There's the bird over there. Is, you know, like everyone's saying about something else that they're, that, they're, you know, that they're doing. So I see this person look up. I'm like, we're in a closed room. We're not outside. What are they looking at? Is there a leak? So I look up, and I don't see anything. Then I look back at this person, and then I see his eyes are going like a thousand times per minute, like back and forth, like from, from left to right, left to right, left to right. Like, like, like it was something that was not like, even if I tried, I couldn't even mimic like a tenth of the speed that they were doing it. So my first response was this. And, um, but, but, and, and I was like, okay, fine, whatever this, this issue was, I didn't do it. But I kept, they kept on doing it. Like every so often, I was trying to mind my own business, but I, every so often they just kept on doing that. And it was like, I'm like, they see demons here. Like, what are they looking at? So I don't think it was. A, I don't think it was a seizure. It wasn't. No. They have, there's something called like a blank yeah, seizure. Yeah, I had a kid who used to just. This happened maybe uh, more than 15 times in 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> That's not a seizure. Yeah. yeah. This was not. This was not a seizure. So as far as I know, maybe it was. But the point that I'm bringing this story is, it doesn't mean that if you see somebody, there was obviously was some sort of medical condition. Just because you see that someone do that, and I've seen it, doesn't mean like. Oh, the demon is inside of this one. You know, like you know, it doesn't mean that they're possessed. Doesn't mean that they're anything. It is possible to have these criteria, and um, you know, they're not possessed. She goes on and she continues and she says, when she's lying in her bed, she has the sound of a loud hammer, like pounding against something, and she's which doesn't let her sleep. You ever try to sleep when you know there's a construction happening, like right outside your window? Imagine the construction is happening inside your head, right? So they, she was not able to sleep. It was causing her tremendous suffering, tremendous pain. But she couldn't even tell her aunt. She didn't. She was afraid of the aunt more than she was afraid of what's going on in, inside of her. So she waited until her mother returned from Persia. When her mother returned from Persia, she went and they took them. First thing, they took them to this Muslim uh, heebie-jeebie guy who is, you know, you know, like exorcism specialist. You know, for ninety-nine ninety-nine, you get to all your demons possessed. You know, and a, a two-for-one deal if you bring a family member. You know, you get a discount. So, anyways, they go to this. They get this Muslim. Um, this Muslim, you know whatever, you know, magician, I don't know whatever they, they call him. There, there is a terminology for it, but, but I don't, I'm not familiar with it. And he looks into, in, into this whole situation and he diagnoses that she has a very powerful Christian demon inside of her. So 
he tried to exercise it, he tried to go and remove it, but nothing, ha nothing happening. So they went and uh, one day they were going and they went to pray in uh, this, this uh, holy, uh, holy rabbi's kevel, the grave, and on the way back they intended to going back to this Muslim guy, see if he could try it, try, uh, try it again. And as they were going back, they somehow they ended up in front of Rabbi Yehuda Fataya's house, of this rabbi's house. So they said to each other, they said, listen, we're here already. Let's see what the rabbi has to say. Why people go to the rabbi last? The rabbi should go first. I don't know. So anyways, so the rabbi is, is, who wrote down the, the story says, you know, he sees this young girl who comes over to him and she's crying about all the pain and the suffering. He felt so bad for her. He had so much compassion. And he decided, he said, you know what, let's see if you really possess. And he started doing these type of tikkunim, the unifications. And all of a sudden, the, the, there was a voice that was coming out of, inside of her that was not hers that started screaming, started screaming, screaming until, um, so, so this is where um, the rabbi was able to get some information from this spirit that, that indeed she was possessed. Uh, this spirit told the rabbi that she was unfaithful to her husband when she was married. And then the rabbi went and he asked her a series of questions and we're going to go through the, um, we're going to go through just the answers part. That's how the rabbi also, Rabbi Hudafetai, how he writes a lot of the, of, this, of the stories over there is that he says, you know, you, there's no point of writing the questions, you'll get the questions by the answers. So she says and she explains that after her body was buried, five destroying the destroyers, uh, these, these, uh, these mazikim, these angels came over to her and they started beating her, beating her, beating her until for three days and three nights. After three days and three nights, they um, gave her a powerful, you know, blow and like a, like a, there's a better word for that. I don't want to say, not a punch, but like a powerful hit. And she flew basically up to, up to the, um, the, you know, to the heavenly court. When she gets to the heavenly court, she is standing over there and she has, she has three judges that she's standing in front of. And the one in the middle was the greatest and all, he says all of them, their, their faces were shining like the sun. And the court goes over to her and says, tell us the prohibitions, the isurim, tell us what you did wrong in this world. That's how, by the way, when you get up to the next world, you judge yourself. You say what you did wrong. So she's like, I, I've done nothing wrong. I'm an angel, you know, I'm a princess over here. So what they started doing, they started beating her and beating her and beating her until she was forced to tell them. So she said, you know, I spoke dirty words with my neighbor uh, by a guy by the name of Solomon. Salaman. Um, and they said to, her, they said to her, uh, and you did nothing else wrong, just uh, speaking words. And she was so scared of the beatings again that she says, no, 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 that he was, you know, he was intimate with me. So then they go, the court asks her, how many years was he with you? So she says, only one year. And then they started beating her again and again and again and again until she said, no, no, okay, fine, fine, fine. It was five years. And then the court goes, and how many times what, did this thing happen in that five years? And she says, you know, I can't really say maybe 50 or 60. And since the court really knew, they knew that she doesn't know the exact amount, they didn't beat her, but they told her it was 100 times, 100 times even, is what you, is, is what you did. And they continued, it says that the heavenly court, they took your life away so that your husband is no longer committing a sin by being with you. Because what happens is if a woman commits adultery, she is no longer allowed to be with her husband. And if she is with her husband, there is a problem with that union. And that's, that's a sin in itself. So they took her earlier so that her husband won't, won't continue sinning. The, and they go in and they say the verdict is, the verdict the court, the heavenly court says that the, you're going to be turned over to these destroyers. Um, and by the name, it's not clowns. They'll be like, come on, we'll have a good time. Or Andreas, you know, little bubbles, we'll see Disneyland. You know, you know, it's not going to be fun in games. Their names are in English. It's destroyers, maziki, you know, these mazikim. And uh, he sa and they go on and say, the, you're going uh, to, the, the punishment is going to be, you're going to be handing them over for 100 years. One year for every time that you did that sin with, with, uh, with that man. Which we see from here, that every time that you make a sin, every time you make the sin, even if, even if it's the same sin, you have to get a tikkun on that and the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, that in itself. That's why there's a lot of people the way that they, uh, you know, an example like this, they think, you know, that, uh, you know, they have, they, they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend they're, and they're, you know, they're not Shomer Nagia, they don't, they don't, uh, you know, they, they touch each other. They think, okay, whatever, I'm doing this already, so what's the big deal? It doesn't work like way. You don't get a package deal. It's not like, okay, you know, you, you did this, this was your sin, you get package number three, you know, and this is your thing. Everything is, is catered. If you did the same sin, Twice, you get punished twice for it. If you did it three times, you get it three times. If, and then it's very unfortunate because people think, okay, I'm already doing this. What's the big deal if I do this? It's a very big deal because everything that you do again, and people also think, I already did it. So what's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's a very, very big deal. You get punished. You get judged for every single sin that you do. So the, 
the court continues. It says what you're going to have to do, besides being in their, in their control, you're going, to, you're going to be required, you're going to have to chop wood every single night. Now, I do have to mention there's going to be a lot of things here that sound physical, that do sound physical, and we'll be able, Bezat Hashem, also explain that. The, he says you're going to have to chop wood every single night. With the wood that you chop is what you are going to be burned in front of the court for three hours a night. You will also receive lashes. And then during these hundred years, you'll have to go to the, with these destroyers everywhere they, go, they, they tell you to go. And, and you, you're not allowed to disobey them. After the hundred years is over, you come back to court and we judge you on the other sins. Which means is, this is not even our hold. This is only for that sin in itself. So think of it, of how serious every sin is in itself. People think, okay, what's the difference? The, the, it, it gets me so frustrated because it's not, I mean, people just don't know. It's not their fault. I'm going to Gehenna anyways, I'm going to hell anyways, what's the difference? Uh, you know, like, what? No, it's a very big difference. That's a very, there's, that, that's a, that's very bad. It's like, I'm smoking cigarettes already, might as well smoke crack. No, that's a very, anybody who's normal will be like, that's a very big problem. Uh, uh, we're not talking about chuva. Chuva fixes everything. We're talking about somebody who did not do chuva. Somebody who does chuva and does a real chuva, does a complete chuva, has a completely new person. So the woman continues. This woman uh, continues. I don't know if I mentioned her name was Rosa. Her name was Rosa. This the spirit. His name was Rosa. So uh, this this woman continues and says they, the destroyers they they took her away immediately and they led her to a huge desert that's full of snakes, scorpions, and not just your run of the mill snake and scorpions, but like these like huge dogs, like like supernatural, like spiritual beings. That she says that she was so scared of these things that she, she was shaking with fear, even though they didn't touch her. Just by the mere sight of them was completely shaking with fear. After that, they went, they took her, and they, they gave her 27 lashings in that desert every single day. The third hour of the night, they would take her to another desert, which she goes that no high has ever seen. And she says of herself that I am not able to navigate that place alone. And then that's where they order me to chop wood. I have to get the wood, and then I have to carry it on my beer shoulders and bring it to the court. Where I was, like she goes on, she was again beaten in that court for another hour. And after that, they, she sat down on the pile of wood. They lit the wood on fire. She completely burned to ashes. And then they revived her. And then began the cycle again mm -hmm. from, from the beginning. So the, um, and then after that also, he went back to the desert, got additional, uh, you know, lashings. So this is just for the adultery. Still, Still yeah. This is, yeah. And now the, the spirit, when it's telling this to the rabbi, begins, begins to cry. And she says, you don't even know. You don't even understand this, just the pain of the splinters. The splinters of the wood. And she goes on, she goes to explain. And, and you know, um, he says the splinters, when they, when they touch the flesh, you know how painful that is? And let me try to explain it this way. Have you ever gotten a sunburn? Mm -hmm. Like really bad sunburn? Mm -hmm. Imagine what happens. So you're not sunburned and, and you do this. You give yourself a little, a little flick. It doesn't hurt. No, it's not a problem. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You're sunburned. Let's say you're, you're pretty serious sunburned, and you just do this. It feels like you have, I don't know, like a thousand needles like just went into you. Like it's excruciating in pain. Now, let's take it a step further. Let's say it was not just a regular sunburn. It was a sunburn that your skin is beginning to peel off. Not just the first layer. Like, you know, a little bit uh, deeper into that. And imagine you get another slap on that, on that skin. You know how painful that is? Now, imagine if it's infected and there's pus is going out and it's an open wound. And then you have somebody that gives you a little, you know, there's a little, just a little needle. Just, just pretty. You know the pain that, that, that you would have to go uh, through that? In hospitals, in nursing homes, when people just need to get, uh, you know, their dressings changed, uh, you know, like let's say someone has an open wound and they need to get changed their, their dressing, they have to, some, if it's really severe, they have to medicate the patient with pain medication. That's how serious, that's how bad the pain is so that they don't, uh, so they don't get it. So she goes and she says, the needle, that's how, every needle, every splinter, that's how it feels on my flesh. And she goes on, she says so that her shoulders were so swollen, like if you can understand it, that you could fill a full flask of water from the, from the swelling that she had on her, on her shoulders of just carrying those, um, the wood. And then she goes and she tried to experiment once. She tried to experiment because what they would do is she would carry this, the, the, she would collect the wood, she would cut the wood, and then she would carry it to a completely different place and that to the court, and that's where she would get punished with that wood. So she experiments by removing one twig. Just like see what happens. And when she gets to the court, they see immediately, they're like, no, no, this is not the right amount, go back. She has to go all the way back, get that piece, a little twig, put it back in the pile, and go schlep it all the way back to the, um, to the court. 
And she said, and they would penalize her if, they, if she would do that. So since then, she said she made sure that every time she had exactly the right amount. Then she goes and she continues. At the end of each year, she revisits the court. And they write in, the, in their ledger, this is how many years passed, and this is how many years you have left. She goes on and she says that she has no rest all week. All week there's no rest, but on Friday, from the beginning of the sixth hour, what they do is to the spirits, they bind them in chain, they tie them up, and the destroyers stand guard until after the Shabbat finishes. The Shabbat passes away. Okay. And uh, we didn't, we didn't finish it. <laughs> the spirits go and they sit together. When I, when I, when I was learning this, it literally sounded like an old prison real. tale. Yeah, specifically we're talking about her adultery right now. So the spirits, are, they sit together and they actually speak about what the evil did, things that they did. You know, when I was alive, you know, back in the good old days when I had a heart. You know, and they would, so they would speak about things that they did and about their punishment that they have to go through. And she goes and speaks about herself, her Rosa. She says she prefers to sit alone. But she says, don't think that Shabbat, this is, this is a time when we can relax. She says just the opposite. She says, this is the time that we recall all the suffering that we went through the entire week. And we can't even, this, we, we continue going through the suffering as well um, uh, through Shabbat. And then she goes on and she says that there are spirits that are young as 14 or 15 years old. Which, you know, you think about it, but like, how is that, why are they so young? How do they, you know, what do they get there? We know that the, the heavenly court does not punish anybody under the age of 20. And uh, so, so she answered, it says that that only pertains to this world. In this world, you don't have the heavenly court doesn't punish before the age of 20. But in the next world, you get punished even before that. Then they go, and um, again, there's a lot of questions that the rabbi was asking, and this is what she was responding, but I'm just going based on what she was responding, so it sounds more like a, a, a storyline. So she goes on and she says, um, she says, regarding Kaddish, you know, let's say someone says Kaddish, it should cause you some, um, some you know, reprieve of all the suffering that you're going through in the next world. So she says, yes, it can, but the problem is, is that nowadays in age, the Kaddish is being recited so fast, it's being mumbled, which renders it completely invalid, or mostly invalid. And besides the fact, that besides all that, you have who's reciting Kaddish? Wicked people, people that are desecrating the Shabbat, which, which, val which makes it almost useless, the, the Kaddish. Which reminds me when, um, I don't remember how long this was, maybe a year or so ago, I got a phone call um, one night from a, a, from a person who lost his father. That they buried the, the parent, the father, that day. And they were asking me questions on Kaddish. On, they were actually questions, they were even asked questions on going to the, the mikvah. There was different things that they, uh, that they had concerns with. So um, they said they were going to say, I, I, so I asked them, I, said, I, I don't know who this person was, never met them before. And uh, I said, they, so they mentioned that they're going to go to um, say Kaddish. So from the questions that they were asking me, I sort of could figure out that, you know, it wasn't so religious, this, uh, um, you know, this, this group, this, this person. So I, I said, yeah, Kaddish is very much going to help. You have to make sure you say Kaddish. You have to go to, to, to Minyan and say it with, uh, you know, amongst some people by, you know, go, go to pray for the, in, in the prayer times. So he, I, then I asked him, I'm like, do you keep Shabbat? So he goes and he says, I do not. So I said, you know, the Kaddish, although it, you know, it's good, but it's going to do very little help if you don't keep Shabbat. And he's like, listen, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, it's very hard. I'm like, so I cut him off. I'm like, listen, I'm like, do you? And I, I, I pulled a card that is a dangerous card to pull. Um, and I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but I, I, so I go to him and I'm like, did you love your father? So he's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, don't you want to do something good for him? Yeah, I'm like, you obviously believe in God. You obviously, otherwise, why would you say Kaddish? You obviously in that. He's like, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm like, so why wouldn't you give him, you know, everything that you can? If you keep Shabbat, you know what, you know what merit he's going to have if because of him you're keeping Shabbat now? And, and above that, you're going to say Kaddish? So he's like, I understand. And, and I'm like, you know, and I saw there was still, you know, a little bit of, of kickback on there. And I'm like, listen. I'm like, what already are you doing? On I, I, he wasn't working. So I'm like, what? You need to you need to use your phone. You need to watch TV on Shabbat. Do it for your father. I said, do it for your father at least for for, for a year or whatever, as much as you can, thirty days at least. I, I, you know, do something. At the end of the day, he said, fine, you got it. He said he's going to keep Shabbat and he's going to start. Now I haven't heard from him since. I don't know. Maybe he's an Al Israel. He's probably being a big tzaddik now. Mm -hmm. Let's hope. I don't know what the, what the situation is, but we hope for the best. But. The idea is when you have people that, you know, say Kaddish and they don't keep Shabbat, I mean, good, it, at least they're doing something. But, like, what do you, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, there's a person that's on a diet. So, on one hand, they have a stock of celery, and the other hand, they're eating cake. But they're eating celery and the cake together. I'm like, you know, it's, I guess it's good, you know, you know if you eat enough celery, you know. But, but at the same point in time, you know, you're, you're not helping as much as you possibly could. So, she goes on, and she says that... Um, most of the, 
you know, and she says she, what she hangs around with, and she hangs around with only adulterers. She only sees the, the people that committed adultery. So the rabbi asks her, says, what about, let's say, a committed adultery, which means, uh, you know, Jewish to Jewish, everything in the, in the Jewish realm. So the rabbi says, well, I don't understand. What happens if somebody, you know, where you don't see people that lie with, uh, with non-Jews? So... Because he said, you know, he says we know that the the, the czar, the Kabbalah speaks about that. What happens if you if you're someone if a man is with a non-Jew, then this not this Gentile woman is bound to this person in the next world like a dog. So how do you explain what that means? You have the Arizal and you have the you know the Zohar it gives the explanations. One interpretation is that you actually become reincarnated in a dog. Another interpretation is also is that um, is that you come back as a you know come back as a Gentile, um, which means is if someone has relations with a Gentile and doesn't do tshuva, comes back to this world as either a dog or a Gentile. And um, so the rabbi asked, I said, why don't, like, why don't you see these people, the people that are in this realm? So she said, I don't know, but it says it could be it's possible that due to God's loving kindness, what he put people together in a certain sin. People that did a certain sin all hang out together so as to reduce you know, any more embarrassment, or I don't know what, what would be the, the actual uh, reason for that is. She says, but possibly, if let's say somebody did two big sins, then they could go to two different, they, they would be with two groups. And that's not a bonus. That's not like you go to the guard and be like, yeah, I have an oil entrance visa. You know, <laughs> I belong here, I belong there. It's nothing to be proud about, and it's nothing to be there. But that could be our people that would be involved in both of those uh, groups. So she goes on and she continues. So she says, after two years, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, with the spirit is that they also, they hover. They don't, they don't walk. It's, it's more of a flying uh, type of thing. So she said after two years, she, w uh, she was hovering over the place of the vicious of beasts. She was decreed that she has to go and hover over the seashore for seven consecutive years. After that seven years, she has to then go to two years over the cemetery in Baghdad, uh, the city where she was born in. And, um, and she said that there is no greater suffering in the world than hovering over the graves of the dead. It's the, the, the smell, the stink that the spirits can feel, that the spirit can sense, is so, it's a, she said it's an indescribable suffering. And I'm not going to get into it, but she even saw her own psyche in that, in that graveyard. And it's very interesting, but if anybody wants, you could go look into it. I don't want to get into it now. Um, you can look into the set, though. The, she goes on and she says, at, as for the remainder of the 100 years, they decree that she has to hover on the highest stratosphere, uh, which is 40 years above the Earth, and that's the distance. And she goes on, she says when she goes and she's decreed to hover over the seashore or the cemetery or anything in the world, the, 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 the height that they hover is between two to three stories above ground. And she goes on, she says it's not because they don't have the strength to go and fly anywhere or go get to anywhere, but she says because they have the capability of flying from Earth to Heaven in 15 minutes, a quarter of an hour. That's how long it'll take them to fly from Earth uh, to Heaven. But being that they, uh, that they are decreed to hover in a certain, to a certain area, they are required there and they don't have permission to go any higher. She goes on furthermore and says that they fly in an upright position, not like as if you're swimming or like you think Superman is, that you just point your <laughs> fist to wherever you want to go, and that's where you go. They fly as if that they're, uh, as if that they're wa walking. And she continues that they, when they fly over their own country, it gives, a, it gives them for some reason relief. Uh, but if the destroyers want to make the burden heavy, they make them fly, it, make, them, make them go to a place that it is not where they're used to, some distant land. Don't think of it, okay, let's go, let's go to Hawaii. You know, we're going to go hover in Hawaii. That, that's not going to be any, they, they feel the, the best where they are, where they, were, where they lived. So uh, she goes on, she says that even though there, there's always a certain area, there's like a border where, they're, where they're, uh, you know, they were decreed to stay. In that border, they, they could go around that border, but they cannot leave that border. If they do leave that border, the, the, um, the destroyers, the mazikim, are able to beat them with even more things that they were described from beforehand, from, from, from the court. So, however, something very interesting, that within that border, they are able to, to run away from these destroyers. So, yeah, how, why and how, I, I don't know, but they are able to, uh, to do that. Then, uh, you know, Rabbi Yehudah Fatai goes on and explains that, uh, oh, she, before we get into that, she also says that they don't have, they're not allowed to beat them any more than they're exactly as, they, as they're prescribed by the court. And further, they, they can't prevent them from causing any mischief. If they want to cause any mischief or harming people or entering them or things like that, they cannot, uh, um, you know, uh, prevent them. These, these uh, the, you know, the people that are the officers, the, these, uh, spirit, these uh, destroyers. Rabbi Deftaya goes on and says that, you know, there's a general rule that you could tell if the spirit 
is, and under certain circumstances, if, if the spirit is a male or a female. And let's say a woman is possessed. So if she sees in her dream a man that's standing in front of her, or is being intimate with her, or um, not letting her do housework, not letting her be with her husband, then you know that spirit is a male. Because the spirit is inside, so everything that she does, that spirit also does, and it, it, it grosses that spirit out and doesn't want to do those things. So it prevents her from being, like, for example, with her husband. However, on the flip side, if you have a man who is, how do you know, is possessed by a female spirit, is if in a dream he's having relations with a woman or he, and he's ex experiencing random you know, uh, emissions. So that, that would mean that it would be a, a woman inside. And granted, you know, this is more of a men topic and more of a men thing that just because a man would have this type of situation doesn't mean that he's possessed. More likely than not, he is not guarding his eyes or he's not guarding his thoughts. That, that's why it's happening. But... The rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yudav Tai continues and he explains that this is specifically where the spirits were adulterers. If the spirit were not adulterers, then these things do not apply. These, uh, these methods do, uh, do not apply to, uh, to them. So the, the spirit Rosa goes on and she explains, she says, you know, that I would not have been compelled to speak to you if not for the, in, you know, the, the many blows that you gave me with those tikkunim, the, the, these uh, uh, unifications that you, did, uh, that you did on me. And she says also that if you do it sporadically, the spirits are not going to say anything to you. They're not going to talk to you. But rather, when you do it again and again and again, it becomes unbearable. That's when they're going to. That's when they're going to deal with you. But she said at the same time, you have to be very careful because if you annoy them or harm them, they could harm the person that they they are. Um, they are. They are in, in whatever possessed that they, they possess them. So the rather is you have to go and engage them with words, especially if they're scholarly and explain to them. And that's why you see a lot of times we speak about that we know a lot about them. Why do we know a lot about them? Because that's the way to get them out. You have to go and speak to them. You have to you know, find out what happened and, and, and how to uh, treat them appropriately. Then she goes on and she explains that if, let's say the, someone was possessed and the spirit that possessed this person was not accustomed to drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes and that person smokes cigarettes or drinks alcohol, it's going to taste really bad because the spirit's not used to it and doesn't want it. So it would actually um, become bitter or, or disgusting. Now let's speak about what a spirit could see, what a spirit uh, you know, has the capability of. So the, she goes on and she explains, and she says, not all spirits are able to see all the sins that people do. The generally, if they committed that sin, they could see that in anybody else. And not only they could see it in anybody else, they know all the details, all the scary little tiny details of that sin. If they have the same sin, they, 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 they're able to see it. To the extent that, let's say it was adultery, they would know, or, or anything related to that thing, they would know if it was a single girl or a married woman, a widow or a divorce, if it was a Jew, a Gentile, how many times, if it was a male, if it was a female, what, every detail on it. Furthermore, besides that, they could also notice, they could also, they could also tell the names. They're just looking at the one, the, the one person. They're able to tell the name of that person, the father's name, the adulteress or the adulterer's name, their father's name, the name of the city, the place where they did the sin, um, the hour, the day, the month of the year, whether she was a pure or, or a menstruating, pregnant or not, alive or dead, they know all the tiny, tiny details. The scary thing you know, about this is that if a mere spirit who caused so many things has all these details, you know the embarrassment that we're going to have to deal with in the next world? That they're going to go over there, everybody's going to see exactly what you did. The bouchard, the embarrassment is unbearable. That is one of the worst things that that happens in the next world is the embarrassment that a person has to deal with and go through during those times. So uh, unless, of course, they do tshuva. If you do tshuva, you study Torah, you go closer, closer to God through prayer, you refrain from all the sin, then you could become, and this she explains, you become completely a new being, completely a new person and, and healed completely. Of course, if the tshuva is complete, 100%, you, it, it's as if that sin never existed. The power of tshuva should never be underestimated. She goes on and she explains that furthermore, she says if let's say she looks at a person and she sees that this person was possess is possessed by a spirit, they know also all the details of the possession. How long has it been since this spirit died? Was it a male or a female? Uh, the name of its name, the name of its town, the name of its father and mother. How many years has it been in this person? The reason that it entered this person. The sin for that they became a spirit. The spirit's character is a gentle. It's a, what, every single tiny detail. So the rabbi you know, had an idea to see if the spirit was telling the truth. The, um, a while before that, there was, um, there, was a, there was a person that came over to him and he said he had a, this person uh, told over the rabbi uh, about a certain dream that he had and he said that um, he had an opportunity to do a great, great mitzvah doesn't specify what the mitzvah was and then he had a dream after that and the dream was that they told him from, you know, from the heavenly realm that for the last 14 years he was possessed by a spirit and then he didn't know and that spirit was, in, but was near his right thigh 
but the spirit couldn't do any harm to him because he occupied himself with Torah and good deeds. And because of that, the spirit couldn't do anything. And then he did this great mitzvah that the spirit couldn't deal with it anymore and, couldn't, and, it, and it left him. So the, the rabbi said, you know, if this spirit is really changing the truth, she'll be able to see everything about this guy. So he calls this guy in to, to the spirit, where, you know, to the possession place. And the second that this spirit, who was possessing the 17-year-old girl, saw this man, she immediately told him everything exactly what they said in the dream. You had it this for 14 years, and this is where it dealt. She knew everything about it. So the, she goes on, and she says, and she continues, which means, by the way, that she was obviously saying the truth. Um, when, when she goes on, when a spirit enters a person, it says it's usually because of a sin. And the officers in charge, they would even permit them to go in. And we said before that they don't have to give, you know, they, they, don't, they can't prevent it, but here they could actually permit them to go inside to that person and, and possess that person. However, when they, since they go in with permission, they go in without any pain. They just sneak right in. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But when they leave, when they get departed, when they get exercised, it leaves with tremendous pain. On the flip side, she goes on and she says, if they enter without permission, which means there's somebody that didn't commit any sin, and it enters in. And now I'm unclear about this, like why and how should that be? But again, everything is for a reason, for a purpose. I'm just, I'm not sure on the details on why a person should get possessed if they didn't do any sin. So this, I'm, I'm unclear. But she goes on, she says, if it enters without any sin, without any reason, and there really shouldn't be entering, then it caused tremendous difficulty and pain to go inside. As she says, as she, as she had to do to this 17-year-old girl, which means the 17-year-old girl didn't do anything wrong, she actually entered like a, like a, you know, like a, I guess like a thief trying to break in. However, when she leaves, it's not going to be any painful, and not pain, because she went in with pain. So she goes on, and she says, you know, there are spirits that have wings with which to fly, but most do not have wings. And she says, every Saturday night, we, they release the chains that they're banned after Shabbat, and they're gi given permission to wander and fly for three hours. After three hours, they have to return to the authority in charge of it. She goes on and says, that's why Saturday night, Moteh Shabbat, that's why there's a lot of times that there's, there's possessions that happen on Moteh Shabbat because of that. And the, spirit, the story that we have over here also happened on Saturday night. This also happened particularly Saturday night. So the, she, she says that some spirits, they, when, they, when they enter, they don't, uh, they don't cause a person harm. They're only after they get used to the area, they get comfortable about it. You know, you can turn on the heat. Turn on the heat, please, will you? Oh. So um, they, they, um, they go, and after they, after they get comfortable, then they could start making a person uh, suffer. The rabbi then asked them, he said, what's the difference between day and night in, in the next world? So she, she goes on, she says, the night shines as bright as day. However, there's a difference in the color between the night and the day. The night is a deep blue, while the day is white. And she goes on, she says the measurement of hours is the same in this world, no different. Which means is there's a lot of questions that people often ask, like how does it work 12 months in Gehenom, it's a next world, it should be no time and space, it's a different, it's a different uh, you know, thing. So it's actually something very interesting that we learn from here, is that there is time in the next world, at least in a certain aspect of it. Now this is my understanding of it, I may be incorrect in this, but this is how I understand it from my, from my limited knowledge on these uh, topics, is this is how I understand it. The, um, you know, what is the whole purpose of Mashiach? We did, we did like one or two classes on Mashiach, right? So, um, we, <laughs> so we, the, the purpose of Mashiach is, it's sort of a, um, a transition stage. You have this world, and then you have Olam Abba. But the problem is you can't transition from one to the next. So the, the transition period is the Mashiach state. So maybe, possibly, and this is my own thoughts on it, and I may be incorrect again, is that Gehenom, all that in between, Kafa Kela, this in be, maybe we could say that it's an in-between stage between here and the next world. We know that there's even in, you know, that, for example, Gehenom, Gan Ed, you know, Gan Eden, there's levels, there's different levels to it, and you have a similar body, and it speaks about certain clothes uh, in Kabbalah. So there is a physical aspect to it, per se. What is it in exactly, you know, that, that, I, that I can't say. So the, the rabbi goes and he says that, and that's why, by the way, we speak about things like fire, and you speak about things like carrying the wood and all these things. So there is, maybe it's that, that we could say that it's that in-between uh, stage. So the, um, the rabbi goes on and, and um, he was actually here, I was actually able to speak also to one of the officers in charge of the destroyers of this, of this, uh, of this person, so of the spirit. So not the actual spirit, but now one of the mazikim. And uh, we'll speak more about the mazikim next time we do this topic, we'll give, that's where we're going to focus a lot about that, uh, that details. So the rabbi asked him, he says uh, to, these, to, these, uh, to, these, uh, to these officers, he says, uh, do you guys each have your own wife? 
So he says, no. This, the officer said, we have very, the, by officer I mean the destroyers. He says, we have very few females, about one to every eight males. And he goes and says, most men don't ever marry. But at the same point in time, they don't have any lust for women. They, they only crave, they only desire to pursue the souls of human beings and to beat them and to get like a mission. And that's, that's all they care about. And furthermore, they, they don't have any incest prohibition. A man can be with the, you know, the mother. There's no, there's no connection to the children that are born. It says that these are not angels. So what, I don't... We'll, we'll speak about it ne next week. Well, this is just giving you a... Tip, you're gonna, I, I know there's a lot of questions that come up. Next time we speak about this topic, we'll probably answer a lot of it. We're gonna, that's what we're focusing on. So the, um, he says that's why a few women are good enough for us because, you know, one person... You know, it's not, this is not something that they do. And he says even more, he says, if let's say, you know, they, they have someone has a child in that, in that realm, the children... As, as soon as they're born, they don't have a connection to the parents. They fly away looking for a mission. They're not like, oh, okay, baby, you know, like, and put them in a little demon crib, you know, and they have a <laughs> bunch of fire turning around. It's not, not none of that. So they they um, they go and they fly away to try to get some sort of an uh, assignment. The spirit Rosa goes and, and she finishes off and she says, you know. And this is, by the way, this is a continuation. This is not a period over. This is not like one conversation. This is, this is you know, exorcism. It takes it's, it's tremendous amount of time that the rabbi put into this. So. At the end, I want to. I want to just being that it's late, we're going to finish with this with this idea. The the Rosa, you know, Rosa said that at the end, she says, you know, she doesn't care about the court anymore, and uh, she says, um, she says, I don't have to go back there until the next hundred years. And she goes on because the rabbi was trying to get her to leave the girl, to, to leave the girl. And the, the spirit says, I'm not leaving the girl. I'm not. I'm not leaving the girl. And she says, except on her wedding night and the time that she's with her with her husband. So, and they said also the heavenly court excommunicated her, had her but this, the spirit was not even ashamed to, tell, to say that. And the rabbi continued the unifications on, on the tikkunim on her until he brings down the date, the 21st of Adal, where she and her mother, they moved to, um, they moved to, to, uh, to a different place where she later got married. And he followed, the rabbi followed up and he heard from the people that when she got married, the spirit completely uh, left her. So we see over here, um, and that was the end of that, uh, you know, of that uh, particular story. So we see over here the importance of, uh, of, of thinking about sins that happen. Don't underestimate sins. Don't underestimate the power of Chuba. These things have to, be, have to be dealt with and have to be. You don't want to get into the next world and be like, okay, you know, um, I forgot about this. I forgot about this. Don't wait for Yom Kippur to do Chuba. You did something wrong. We all, we all are human. We all fall. You get up right then and there. You do tshuva to the best of your ability, and you go on. And I strongly recommend if somebody wants to have a, you know, a good uh, the, one of the best tshuva books. You read a tshuva, uh, It's they have it in English. It's called Sharei Tshuva, the Gate of Repentance. Sharei Tshuva. You read, go into English. They have an English version of it. It's called the Gate of Repentance. They have many different uh, versions of it. I forgot who's the publisher on it. Um, and but actually, when you read these books, it's not like okay, you actually have to put these things into practice. Some things are going to be more easier than others. Um, in, in the respect of tikkunim and fasting, speak to your local Orthodox rabbi. The majority of them will say don't uh, don't do that. Um, but uh, you know, unless you're on a very 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 high level. So, but the tshuva nonetheless should be done, and it should be taken into extreme extreme importance. The um, the one of the most important things that we spoke about, and, and you realize the underlying theme over here is the the sin of adultery. Now. Um, I've been asked a few times to give a class on adultery, and I, I've given the class before, never on camera, um, and I don't know, I don't feel, I don't know, I, I don't feel like I sh that's, that's an appropriate class, so I'm not, I'm not looking to give it, but this is the way that I'm sort of sneaking it in. Um, the, and, and this is a very, you know, it, people think, okay, it's not such a big problem, it, what's the big deal, uh, not an adultery I'm talking about, uh, about the following thing I'm going to say, um, it, which, which I hold very much as a big problem when people have couple friends. Couple friends is um, where you have two married people and two other married people, which are friends, which is not a problem, not a problem, of course, be friendly, you have friends, it's not a problem, but where I'm talking about, they go to vacation together, they do everything, like very, very close. That is very, very unhealthy. That is very, and I've, you know, I've spoken to people, be like, well, when me and my husband go out, we're kind of bored, so we, you know, you know, we, we, we got, and so I go, I go, wait, relax for a second. So, um, <laughs> so I go, and I said, you have more problems 
if you cannot deal, if you cannot go out with your husband and have a good time with just your husband, you have more problems than going and inviting couples out, with, you know, to go with you to go with that. Now, again, that's not a problem. You want to go out to dinner one time with a friend, by all means. But where it becomes a very big problem is where you have one woman is texting her, you know, the the other, you know, her friend's husband, be like, hey, I want to buy, uh, you know, my husband a gift. Well, since he's your friend, I want to know what should I get him. Like that is not your place to be. You are not allowed to do that. That is a very big problem, and it leads to very serious problems. I hear about these problems. I'm not going to go into stories uh, uh, about these things, but this is something very serious and it should be taken appropriately. Yeah, you think it's all fun and games. What do you think? That men don't have temptation just because they're married and women don't have temptation if someone's giving them more attention or something's doing that? This is a very, very serious problem. I think it's very serious nowadays and it should be taken appropriately. You're married. You're supposed to spend time with your husband. You're going on vacation. That The point of vacation is to reconnect with your husband. That is one of the main points that you should be going on vacation. Not you know, having a good time with your husband. Now granted, is it terrible if you want to go and it's a whole people going to Shabbat? I'm not saying, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about those. I think you get the idea of where I'm talking about. Where about certain places, people that, uh, they're just too close for comfort. And it's, gets, and, and it's, and it's really, you know, it, it's, it's really problematic. I don't think we have to go into details. I think, uh, you know, everyone can understand on their own level what I'm referring to and, and how important it is that your best friend should be your spouse. And that's it. You don't need more friends in that, in that aspect, especially of the opposite gender. Of the same gender, Hazakabul has as much friends as you want. But make sure that your spouse gets the most attention that they, you know, that they need because they should be your best friend, not your, you know, this other is my, you know, this is my BFF, you know. And together, they gang up on the, the you know it's like it, the stuff that goes up there it's 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 terrible i wanted to put that a little bit inside over there okay any questions yeah. Wait, you know because i got i have so i had people that requested that they want the questions on because sometimes they have their own questions so they want i know i get both of them so i, I think that's a good idea because you know it's interesting because last time i said a class that we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't uh, put the questions anymore so, which people requested me, but then at the same time, people also emailed me like, but we like the questions also, but maybe not in the middle, at the end, so we get to understand it. So, if you have any questions you want off the camera, by, no, by all means, we'll do that afterwards, but anybody who has a questions that they don't mind the camera to be on. Yeah, um, you said that uh, you would explain, like, um like the whole chopping the wood and, and bringing it How is it physical? The yeah. same idea with time, with, with the time. So you see that there is time in the next, in the next world, so there is some sort of physical aspect of it, because time only exists where there is, uh, what is it, space and matter? Uh, you know, yeah. I don't know, I don't, I'm not a physicist, but, you know, okay. it equals mc squared. Yeah. And, then, and then you said that, like, she was only with adulterers, right? She, her, the section that this spirit was in was only with adulterers. So there were 14 year old adulterers? Doesn't make sense. Maybe they did. She, like, you know, she, she was married and she was with another man. Like, like with him, not like talking to him. No, 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 like with him. They were physical. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not high fiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just confused. No, I just want to make it out very clear. So, so is well, it, of course, it's, you're not. So you have to show me the is also for married people that they can't. Uh, um, if you're you high fiving the opposite sex, are you, cre- are you committing adultery? You're not committing adultery, but it's you should refrain from doing that. Also, so is it worse to be? What's an idea? Is it is it worse to be with the non-Jew or a Jew? I'm very confused. Ah, the famous question that I have all the pervert men yes. ask me. Well, what's it better to be with a woman or be, to be with I a, a that? Sp- I asked me this question. I, I, I generally don't answer that, and uh, the, one of the reasons is is that it's like saying, how would you rather die with a nine inch knife or a fourteen inch knife? Well, you know. What do you mean like, the nine inch knife? Well, it depends. Then you have to slice more often. Well. It, they're, they're both bad. Again, you want to split here as you could go between the difference between Kabbalah and, and and halacha. What is different? Both of them are very bad and should be stayed very far away from it. Like that That's the only answer that you're going to get from uh, from anybody who is you know of, of any Torah knowledge. They're both terrible. How would she have done tshuva for yeah. being an adulterer? So the, she would have to. Th- so that's a very very good question. She would have to. Uh, the question is for the people on the uh, you know on the cyber world. Um, how could somebody do tshuva for adultery? That is something that they do have to speak to a local Orthodox rabbi for. The, you know, depending on the situation, there's a lot of variance that has to come into play. Um, and the besides, she has to do the basic stuff: regret it, confess it, and make sure never to do it again. And that's not enough, by the way, to say like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. And but there is a lot more that she needs to. 
the details I don't want to get into. They have to speak to a local Orthodox rabbi because there's a lot of factors that have to come into play. Now does she have to tell her husband? How is she supposed to tell her husband? There's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, so that is something that they have to speak to the local Orthodox uh, rabbi. So what? then she could go back to her husband once she does Shuba. Or she has to divorce him and leave him. Yeah, Let's speak to your local Orthodox what rabbi is what I would say. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying that. The, well, it, she would yeah. Have to go to her rabbi? She would have to speak to the rabbi, and they would say they are not. She is not allowed to be with her husband anymore. That's it. She lost it. Like forever. Oh, she lost. It. So then she. Not not even her husband, and not her not the person that she committed adultery with. She she can't now leave her husband and marry the adulterer. She has to start fresh, even if she has like kids with a guy. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. What if what if like she 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 has relations with her husband and has a kid? Is that kid pure? The you kid. Keep so right. So that. She did it before or after, no. No, she's talking about before, obviously. Oh. Right. So, um, is the you know is the kid considered a mamzel? Is what you're asking? Then no, unless she had the kid from the adulterous you know if it was adulterous no, unit. If it was with her husband, so again, what is the, you, there's nothing that you're that you're going to tell the kid to do. You're not going to dunk him in the mikvah every no, extra day for I'm a saying, by him. Because you said that like we don't have to really worry about that kind of stuff now. Like everyone's somehow pure. It comes up being born pure. So I'm, that is something completely. You're talking oh. about that. You're talking about somebody who. How do you know? If th this is a question that gets asked a lot for Balchubas that they say let's say their parents weren't religious how do they know that the mother had them while they were they were in Ida right. and they, that that was where I gave that yeah, answer yeah, yeah. not and this is completely this is different, different. Like, yeah can't completely different can't compare right. and what's the name of the book again? Minchat Yehuda or I don't remember if it's Minchat Yehuda Minchat Yehuda Minchat Yehuda, Minchat Yehuda. If, she didn't go to if, so, if a woman doesn't go to a uh, mikvah, then her husband's not allowed to be with her. And you could, and again, I you know, could. But our parents, my mom. Never right, so yeah, so exactly, so that's what I we're referring to. Take it back from no, her, no, that's, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so when you do tshuva, you still get punished for. No, if you do complete tshuva. Not at all. Like, Real good tshuva. Never if you do again. complete tshuva, like full on tshuva from ahava, from love, the highest level of tshuva, nothing. As if it never happened. Never happened. Not only that, well, it, it could even turn into a, a merit. Okay. Not, um, but again, I gotta be clear. Don't go and be like, okay, I'm gonna do this sin, so I'll make it and turn it into merits. I, then I'll do it with this I'll and I'll, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, what if you didn't know? Um, that it's a sin, and you didn't. Didn't know adultery is a sin? No. Oh, you're talking about something else. Oh, okay. like, I'm like, now I think people know. Um, um, you, that's, a, that's still a sin by Shogeg, and you still have to do Chiba on, on, on Shogeg so by accident. What if you don't remember? Like, what, what does this do? <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. Like, how many years have I been living? What happens, what happens to you if somebody comes into the hospital and says, I don't remember if I took poison? What do you do usually? Oh, that? So you could actually test them, right? So that is different. No, but so, I learned something. You get, whatever it is. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, before, like, we're shining, you have all this paper. So I heard something. I don't remember oh. the source. No, I'm okay. We're almost finished over here. How far back does God expect you to go on, like, repenting your sins? On the sins that you are not <laughs> Meaning, like, you can you know, you could have done so many things. I like that, but... don't remember, then you cannot repent. But don't push things off and be like, okay, I'll eventually forget yeah, exactly. about this. Yeah, right yeah. Like the, the idea behind tshuva is that you should do tshuva right away. If you sin, mess up, get up, and do tshuva. This way, you, you keep a clean but slate. If you weren't aware of... So then that's something that... that the tshuva is... Is existed, right. So, that, so I guess you could use that... Right, you don't know. Right, so if you don't know of all the things they did, but you know the basic stuff, like... The basic stuff that you could do tshuva on. I'm probably still doing things on that I don't even know about. That's why you come to these classes. So yeah. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get the yeah. So. If it, she turned it off. My husband listens. <laughs> 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 He's like, I heard your voice on yeah. it. Um, two more questions. One, you were saying that thousands of people hear your voice. <laughs> you were saying that the the, the, like the, the souls of the people who were suffering. Um, they were st they still had some kind of prayer yes oh excellent question excellent question question excellent I said question excellent ten times okay <laughs> the because um, I did want to speak about that so the question is do they have free will mm -hmm. I don't know who <laughs> okay I don't know so um, the, we were saying that so, if they go out of the city yeah 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 so, so they do so it seems so the question is is like how how does all these things work can they come in that 
it seems that there is some sort of, again, they are restricted in what they do. They are required to be in a certain area. But at the same point in time, you see rabbis talking to them as if like, you know, can you come out? Let's work on something. Let's do it. So there seems to be some element of free will, but I can't say that for sure because I can only say based on what information that I have. And based on that, the real answer is really I don't know, but it seems like it. It seems like they might have some, some sort of level on that. Some sort of level. Because you see that if she was able to take a needle out, that's free will. That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, so it seems like that. Any other? other yes, go ahead. Um, these people, will they ever have a place in Olam Abba? If After they do tshuva, yeah. After no, they no, do no, the no, tikkunim. After they, they do the tikkunim. Uh, they, they, as long... Yeah, so, so that, that woman a hundred years and then she could no, then she, she got to deal with this is this is not even we didn't speak about Ganom yet. Okay. Um, so this is so now the the question is that the, the once we're in Ganom, did they ever get out? Of yes, there? Pe most people do. The people that do it, we didn't do it. We never did a class on Gehenom. Um, might do it one day. Not we're gonna hold off a little bit. I think gave a lot of uh, scariness now. No, give, no, you know, so, 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 but uh, um, <laughs> I I do want to do a class on it. I, I haven't decided when I'm going to do it. Um, if anybody wants to learn upon it, you go to Rashid Chochma. Speaks about, but again, it's only in Hebrew or the so no problem. And uh, but but there is different levels, and some people if they ever leave, if they don't ever leave, so it's a different class in itself. Uh, you finished questions? Yeah. Okay, questions. Is, is Shabbat one of the, the things that you could come back for? Define that question. Is Shabbat one of the things that you could come back for as a reincarnation to fix Shabbat? No, like this this thing, whatever. To get beaten and stuff. Yeah. To, get, to become a spirit, you mean? Um, so the, the ones, so I can only tell you only based on what the stories are, and the majority of them oh, is, adultery. is adultery. You have some maybe like those wow, suicide or things like that. Wow, that bad. You yeah. have one on suicide. I'm not that I'm going to say. Well, Shabbat, Shabbat is very bad. Um, and um, eating bread on face. Yeah, that's cut, right? Well, those things are cut. Can those things get cut off. Side? Those things that you get cut off from God. Because, right. So no, but then you got you sewed back on. You sewed, you got you got to come back on. You got cut off. No, you're back on. You're back on. So um, now, well, now, now you this is your you've changed. Before you were not religious. Now you know you're on the on the religious path. So of course, what do you you know? So that doesn't mean that you're cut off forever and you're done. But if you do chuba, so that's what your process is, that you're doing it right now. Any other questions? Um, can you pray for these people? Like, yes. Do, does, does, does prayers help? Anything help. You could do zuchuyot for them also. You could do merits for them. You could learn classes for them. Well, you, for these souls. Like, but like, okay. you know? No, like spirits even. Like that possess so somebody else. You learn like, mishnayot. You the merit of the spirits that are suffering, like stuff like that? Yeah, don't say that out loud because people think you're a witch. Oh. And the merit, as you cook in the merit of all the spirits. But you don't. But you, if let's say, but you might have been done. If let's say, if let's say you have a family member that passed away, whatever it is, you could always do anything for their, for their, for their soul to bring them higher. Say, you're learning, you're doing this. You, it's very hard for you to dress modest and you're dressing modest so you're doing that. You could even say that for later. Any mitzvah you do, any Torah that you do, anything they do, you could do for it. Man. As long as you want. For, they could, so over a year? A hundred years. Isn't the whole, like, That's a punishment. Doesn't matter, but they could go still go higher. You're sending them pack. You're able to send packages to your deceased relatives. Like five years later, even fifty years later. Really? And they still like get it? Yeah, I still get it. So if they're and we don't use snail mail that we have over here. <laughs> it goes over there. After fifty years, there's no two-day free delivery. Not in the judging process. They're like they get judged every single year. Really? Every really? single year That's they get judged. Time. It says okay. in Rosh Hashanah, it says that God has the book of the living and the book of the dead open in front of him. Every year you get judged. Now the question is, I'll explain. Ah, that's right, that's right. How old your horses? So, um, the, the, what do you get judged on? You get judged on, on what your residual was in this world. So let's say, for example, somebody opened up a business in this world, and it was an unclean business, an unpure business, a business of very ill repute. And every time that this business continues going, it's all thanks to who? Thanks to, um, you know, this guy who opened up this business. So every time someone does a sin because of him, he gets punished for that. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, but it goes on the flip side. Let's say you open a yeshiva, you give donations, somebody's giving you that. You make somebody religious. Listen to this. You make somebody religious by whatever it is. You bring him to a class or her to a class and she becomes more religious. Think, listen to how great it is. So now, she's now religious or he's now religious now, so they're going to marry a religious person. Now they're going to have children that are religious. The children are going to be learning to Torah. They're going to go to yeshiva. They're going to do a ton of mitzvot. All, who is it thanks to? It was thanks to you. You helped that person become religious. So now, well, you got to your children, yeah. So now you go, and every single year, after you pass away, it's been 120 years, after 120, every single year, now you have this, this you know, huge nation that came out from all the work that you did that made them religious, is all thanks to you. So you get all that reward as well. 
everything good that you do, the same way it goes for your children also, you bring the children in the right path, your children, you, you know, brings merit to the parents. If the parents didn't bring the children up in the right way, then they bring them down. Uh, so every year the person gets judged, depending, think of it as the butterfly effect. Doing good things. That's what I was thinking. Even though my, my parents are not, you know, they're still here. Right. They still get, like, the merit. It would still, it would still, and, and, it, and it, so there, there is a little caveat into that. If the kids brought, if the parents brought them up, uh, so sometimes I'll give you an example. Sometimes you have a parent that is a very righteous parent, but the kid unfortunately goes off and becomes a, a little bit of a rotten apple. And this, it, it, but it's not really due to the parent's fault because the parent really tried so hard. Private tutor is everything. It's just nothing helped. That parent doesn't get punished for that child because as long as you did everything in your power, and again, only God knows, but you did everything in your power to do, and yet the kid still went off, you're not held responsible for that. There's different proofs of it from Moshe, uh, you know, and Shmuel, when, he, when they call him up, uh, um, uh, it, you know, they're, they're very interesting things, but it's in a different uh, class in its entirety. However, on the flip side of that as well, let's say you have a completely irreligious parent, so much so that they hate the Judaism, they hate everything, and they try to prevent everything from happening, so much so, and the kid just happened to become religious, so what are the parents going to get reward for? The kid, they, they didn't do, they wanted to go against it. So as long as they had some sort of effect, even if it's minor, even if it's a minor effect, they were just okay. But God knows. You don't have to know. Think of it that you do and you're giving them good. That's how you should think of it. Yeah, of course. Well, not. It's not like I love you, but I hate you. I love you, but I hate you. It's there's there's different there's different like, uh, you know. You're getting punished for this, but you're getting rewarded for that. Yeah. Like, can't cancel they don't cancel each other out. Different different categories. So different bank accounts. So what's a punishment for something small? Like, uh, the, the, what is a pun? Keep getting punished. No. Well, depending on what the situation is, but possibly. It is, it is. But I, I hope that this should give you a little bit of an idea, a little bit of an inkling of an idea, opening your eyes a little bit. I'm scared, bro. I'm scared. Uh, don't be scared, just do good. Just start, just start. No, no, this is how it starts. My fear has to come alive. All right, don't bow, Hashem. I have one more question. Go on. Sorry, um, what if, like, like, let's say your grandfather or whatever did a sin and he keeps getting punished for it, right? Yeah. Can you somehow, as a grandchild, like, like fix that up yeah. for him or whatever? Doing for him, you know, saying Kaddish, giving charity and that merit does helps a lot. Saying Mishnayot for that soul helps a lot. Okay. You are able to. Mm -hmm. No more questions? No more questions for on camera? Going once, going twice. Hazaku yeah. so This is not bad, even though it's still on camera, but the questions at the end, there's like a whole lecture in itself. Sounds stupid. Yeah. Yeah.